In 2018, I had the honor and privilege of going with a group of teenagers and a couple of the pastors from Family Church to a Mexico missions trip down in the Baja. And it was really the first time in my life that I had experienced real need. Like I was coming face to face with real legitimate physical needs. Like I walk out my front door at home and I see pavement, nice sidewalks, beautiful house on the other street. As I walked down the road in this community that we were serving in, in the Baja, there were dirt roads, but there were these potholes filled with gray water. And and Pastor Craig's like, don't touch that. It can cause infections as there's little kids with no shoes on running through these puddles. And as we were walking about the community, we were letting people know that we were going to put on a VBS and we were praying for people and we were just going house to house. And as we were going house to house, we saw little kids caring for littler kids because dad has abandoned them and mom is out in the fields trying to make an honest day's wages. And we saw houses made out of just ramshackle stuff, just scrap metal and scrap wood. And, and I, I came face to face with real legitimate, urgent physical need. And while we were walking about doing a, our prayer walk and sharing with the community that we will be putting a VBS on, uh, I, it was me and a couple of teenagers from my campus. And then there was two translators with us. They couldn't have been more than 20 years old. And we're walking around sharing with everybody. And one of them gets a phone call from someone in the church that we're partnering with for this VBS that uh, a lady in the community down the road from where we're at needs diabetic medication. Now, none of us are medically trained and she has an urgent physical need. And the, and the translator gets off the phone and says, this woman needs medication for diabetes. We're going to go to her house. And I'm thinking, why? Like, I don't have anything to offer her. We, we don't have anything to offer her. And we get there and she begins sharing with the man. She was teary-eyed and distraught. She begins sharing with the man kind of her story, what the obstacles to getting the medication was. And um, he just relays back to us that there was some financial need um, that she needed prayer for to get this medication. And so we all got in a circle and we held hands. And in Mexico, if you've ever been, uh, when they pray, it's really interesting. Everybody prays out loud at the same time. So here we are standing in a circle, holding hands. This woman joined us. She, she had to have been around 60, maybe 65 years old. And we all start praying out loud. Some of us in English, others in Spanish. And uh, it was really this beautiful moment. But at the end of it, she comes up to me, gives me a big hug with a big smile on her face and happy tears coming down her face. Now her physical need did not change, but a spiritual need was met. And she felt supported as her brothers and sisters in Christ, even us from another nation, came around her to spiritually shoulder this burden with her. Our deepest needs are never physical, they are spiritual. I want to caveat that because I'm not saying physical needs are illegitimate or unimportant. But the base of humanity, our deepest needs are always spiritual, never physical. Our deepest needs are always spiritual, never physical. Today, we're going to continue our series in the book of Mark. And we're going to see Jesus come face to face with urgent, real, physical need and how he points people beyond just the physical problem to a spiritual need in the lives of the people that he's teaching. And so before we jump into the passage, though, I want to remind us of where we've been, okay? Uh, Mark moves to the story of Jesus' ministry at kind of breakneck pace, right? Just boom, 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 boom. Immediately, we go from one story to the next to the next. And Jesus begins his ministry with this proclamation that he is bringing the kingdom of God. He says, the kingdom of God is near, it's close, it's at hand. That heaven and earth are meeting in the person and work of Jesus. And then we see as he goes about his ministry, how the kingdom of God is unleashed in the world, right? As he goes about teaching and people are just astonished at his teaching amazed at how he teaches with such authority. It's like a cool cup of water for a parched, thirsty soul as they listen to him teach. And then they see just miraculous things partnered with his teaching. Firstly, we see people that are disease ridden and and sick and have ailments healed, made whole. And then we see people who are demon oppressed and possessed that are set free. And Jesus, because of all of this ministry and his popularity grows exponentially. 
It says that people were coming to him from every quarter. He, had, he was at an all-time hype. I mean, they were, they were so excited about Jesus. Everybody wanted to be with him. In fact, in chapter one, a couple of weeks ago, we read about how Jesus went away for a few hours to pray and everybody kind of wigged out, where is this guy? We got to find him. And when they find him, Jesus says, we need to leave and go to the other towns that I, might, that I may preach because that is why I came. The gospel of Mark, more than any other gospel, elevates the teaching and preaching ministry of Jesus. And so he says, this is why I've come. We're going to go about from town to town. I'm going to teach, I'm going to preach, and I'm going to proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. It has come in the person and work of Jesus. And so that's kind of the background of where we've been. And we're going to pick up in Mark chapter two, starting in verse one. So it says, and when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Now there's some debate on whose house this was. Was this just the Rando's house? Was this Simon's house uh, that we met in chapter one? Was this actually Jesus's house? There's a lot of debate. Most scholars and commentators agree it was probably Simon Peter's house. And so he's probably at Simon Peter's house. And I love how it says it was reported. It's like there's these people who are just watching Jesus and telling everybody about it. Like it's the first newscast. It was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. Jesus is at home, so everybody's there. What I want you to see in this moment is Jesus is somebody everybody wanted to be around. In fact, his popularity got so large, many commentators say he couldn't really go around very easily in public places and proclaim his, his teaching openly because of the crowd it drew. And so he begins to, to do it in, inside of buildings. And so there's tons of people that this is like an introvert's nightmare. Okay. There's tons of people in this house and he was preaching the word to them. Again, Mark more than any other gospel elevates the teaching ministry of Jesus. Can you imagine this moment? You're in an intimate setting in a home and, and you're listening to the very words of God as he's teaching you. What did the people feel in this moment? They're so intent on Jesus' word and how it's convicting or encouraging or loving and caring for them in this moment. And there's a problem that happens. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof from above him. (laughs) I love that last part. They removed the roof. So a paralytic comes uh, carried by four guys and they get to the entryway of the house and nobody is moving. Nobody's willing to give up their seat uh, and, and, and uh, let this guy through. Like for our uh, modern culture, we, we make accommodations for people with disabilities or ailments. We have handicapped parking, but these people are not moving out of the way for a paralytic. They are not giving up their seat, listening to Jesus. And so when these four guys carrying this paralytic, and, and we don't know their relationship, relationship to the paralytic in this story. But uh, as they're carrying him, they realize this is not working. Like we're not going to get through this crowd. And so they go about a different way. It says they removed the roof from above him. Now a little bit about homes in this day. Homes were mostly centered around a, a one large room, usually called a courtyard. And Jesus was probably standing in the middle of this room with people just surrounding him. And the roof of, of a house during this time wasn't just a covering for the dwelling. It was actually a functional space. They would uh, store things up there often and uh, they'd go up there in the cool of the evening to cool down. And so there was often a staircase that went up the side of the house so that you could have access to the roof. These houses were made out of uh, sun-baked mud bricks and uh, plaster and tiles. Uh, wood was a very uh, expensive commodity. And so it, not many houses had much wood. If they did have wood, it was often in the beams that held up the roof. Okay, so these guys go up the staircase to the roof and it says they removed it. And this, in the original language, it has such gusto behind it. I mean, these guys got some chutzpah. They got some tenacity to, to be willing to unroof this. The, the literal translation of they removed the roof from above him is they unroofed the roof, okay? So like, this is a demolition job. This is not like just gently taking the tiles off and putting them in a neat pile and gonna be fix it later. They're destroying this man's roof. Can you imagine being there? 
right? You're, you're, sin, you're standing there listening to Jesus teaching and you just hear people hammering away at the roof above you as little pieces of plaster fall on your head. You get some in your eye and then a tile falls on your wife's head and you're, you're like, what in the world is going on upstairs? And then you see fingers start to scrape through the roof ceiling and eventually they remove the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. All of a sudden, probably by four ropes held by these men, this body comes down and it's not moving. And if I'm there in the moment, I think, is this a dead guy? Like we need to get out of here. And all eyes are watching as this, as this figure is lowered into the room, finally lays on the ground and they see probably a familiar face. You see, a paralytic was meant a lot for this guy. Firstly, his muscles would have atrophied to the point where he couldn't, uh, he couldn't move himself very well. He probably would have had bed sores. And most people in this community probably would have recognized him because he would have probably been uh, resigned to a life at the city gate begging that others provide for his needs because he can't work. And so they see this familiar face lowered down into the room in front of Jesus. And I think in this moment, all lies are trained on Jesus. How is he going to respond to this moment? What is he going to say? Is he going to rebuke them for, for destroying the roof and, and interrupting his teaching and distracting his listeners? Is he going to rebuke them because this is his buddy's house and he's got to have Simon Peter's back? How will Jesus respond to this commotion in the midst of his teaching. Look at this. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now there is so much wrapped up in this verse. Um, Firstly, when it says, when Jesus saw their faith, I'm not gonna go into this too in depth, but I do wanna make a point here. Jesus saw their faith. Faith is not just some internal, abstract, intellectual assent. The scripture knows nothing of that kind of faith. Faith is revealed in their actions. Jesus saw it in action. They so believed that Jesus could heal this man that they're willing to unroof the roof and lower him down, regardless of what that might cost them. They're, get, they're willing to do anything to get this man in the presence of Jesus, the preaching, miracle-working God-man himself. He saw their faith. Faith is not just an intellectual, abstract, internal assent to certain theological truths. It shows up in the life of a believer. And if your faith in Jesus doesn't show up in your life, in your behaviors, you have to begin to ask yourself the question, do I have faith in Jesus? Because our beliefs are revealed by our behaviors. We see that in these guys. They believed Jesus could do something and they acted accordingly. Our beliefs are revealed by our behaviors. And so Jesus sees their faith and he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now that word son there, Jesus isn't his dad, but he uses this term of endearment that that indicates I'm not mad at you for ripping a hole in the roof and uh, and interrupting my teaching. He, this, this word is like, I love you like a father loves a child. And then he says, your sins are forgiven. And this is the moment where everybody in the room's got a question mark in their thought bubble above their head. Okay. What in the world is he talking about? I imagine the guys up on the roof just watching this all kind of peeking in through the hole they made. It's like, no, he doesn't need forgiveness. His, his legs are jacked up. Can you heal him? Can you, can you fix his body? He's per- paralyzed. And I think the guy laying there on the mat, hearing this from Jesus, might have felt like, yeah, I've heard this before. Because culturally, Jews often believed that if you had an ailment, a sickness or a disease, it was directly tied to some sin issue in your life. But that's not why Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. He says, son, your sins are forgiven because faced with real urgent physical need, Jesus knows there is a deeper spiritual need at hand here. Not that the paralysis isn't a legitimate need. It is. 
but that there's a deeper need at hand, forgiveness of sins. You see, Jesus could have healed this guy and he could have lived a full 70, 80, however many years, healthy, great, but without his sins forgiven, he is eternally separated from God. Jesus speaks to the deepest need of this man. Our deepest need is forgiveness. Our deepest needs are always spiritual. And Jesus speaks to that here. Now, the crowd that's watching this whole thing unfold, there's some here who are not happy with Jesus' statement. It says, verse six, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So here in this moment, there's the scribes and scribes were very educated, learned men. They knew the law very well. They were actually charged with keeping the scriptures, maintaining them, transcribing them as necessary. So these men knew the law and they knew that God alone was the one who could forgive. And when they hear Jesus proclaim forgiveness of sins, they say he's, he's blaspheming. Only God can forgive sins. They're right about that part. Only God can forgive sin. But they're wrong in their estimation of who Jesus is. And they call him a blasphemer. Notice it doesn't say that they said this out loud. They're questioning all of this in their hearts. They're wrestling with this. And their ultimate decision on who Jesus is in this moment is he's a blasphemer, which was a crime that was punishable by death. And so the ultimate end of their logic is this man deserves to die we should probably stone him to death. And Jesus, he's not unaware of what's going on inside of them. It says, and immediately, Mark's favorite word, immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus question within themselves. He perceives in his spirit. They didn't say this out loud. Jesus has this super epic ability called like he just knows all the stuff. He's all knowing. He knows everything and he knows what's in their hearts. He knows the questions that they're wrestling with. And he, and he perceives in his spirit that they thus question within themselves and said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now, there's been a lot of work around this last statement here, uh, verse nine. Uh, Like, what is Jesus talking about here? Why does he say what's easier to say? What we know is Jesus is not simply speaking of the ease of language itself. It's easier to make this statement as less words or less syllables than this statement. That's not what he means. He's actually making a point to these, these scribes that he's going to bear out here in the next coming verses. But most commentators, not all, but most commentators agree when Jesus asks this question, which is easier in a sense saying, son, your sins are forgiven is easier because immediately it does not require verification. You can say to anybody, your sins are forgiven and they won't know that until they stand before the throne of God. In another sense, it is harder to say, take up your mat and walk to heal a paralytic because it requires immediate verification. And he's going to continue with this line of thinking so that he can show something that he's trying to reveal about himself to the scribes. So he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk but that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he links that last statement to this. He's going to do something here in a moment that they may know that the son of man has authority on earth to give forgive sins. Now, when he says the son of man, that, that's kind of lost on us culturally. That's, a, that's not a familiar phrase we use often, but this is not just an indicator that Jesus is born of humanity. This was a messianic title from the book of Daniel. And when Jesus says the son of man and uses that title for himself, all of his original audience would have known exactly what he was claiming. He is claiming to be the Messiah, the Christ, the savior, the son of man. And he says that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And now he's going to do something to prove this, to back up his claim to be able to forgive this man's sins. He said to the paralytic, his eyes turned back down to this paralytic. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. 
And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. Can you imagine this moment? This guy that you've seen begging by the city gate day in and day out, muscles are atrophied. You can see his flesh and skin and bones, but there's not much muscle there. And before your very eyes, his muscles are restored to full health. So much so that not only can his body now bear the weight of himself, but he picks up his mat. Remember, it took four guys to get him there. And now he picks up his own mat. He's walking on his own two legs and says, he went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. We've never seen anything like this. This is incredible. And it's interesting. It says, so that they were all amazed. And so that they all glorified God. It doesn't seem to exclude anybody in this picture. Maybe even the scribes that were really wrestling. And so Jesus does this authoritative uh, teaching that he has the power on earth to forgive sins. And that's what I want us to pull out of this first story here. We're gonna go all the way to verse 17. But for this first story, I just wanna pause and acknowledge Jesus has authority to forgive sins. Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's look at it again. He says, that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Sin is primarily a transgression against the holy God. It is not primarily transgression against humanity. And I want to, I'll say that again. I know that's kind of a loaded um, big sentence, but sin is primarily a transgression against a holy God, not a transgression against people or humanity, okay? Now, clearly Jesus teaches that we sin against each other. He says, if you go to give an offering and you realize you have sinned against someone else, you go and reconcile that. Then you come back and you give your offering. Clearly we do sin against each other. But the greater reality is that sin is primarily a transgression against God. So how can Jesus forgive? If sin is a transgression against God, Jesus can forgive because Jesus is God. The original audience would not have been confused about what he's saying here. He's claiming to be God. He's claiming deity. He's claiming the power to forgive sin. He didn't say, I'll go talk to the father and find out if you can be forgiven. No, he says, I have the authority to forgive you. Sin is primarily a transgression against God and Jesus is God. This is the number one thing that cults and false religions attack. It is always the deity of Jesus. And Jesus here, he says, he is the authority who can forgive the deepest need in our life is forgiveness. And it's only met in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And here's this, this is, this story happens pre-cross, but we live post-cross. So here's what this forgiveness looks like for us today. Jesus, the one who knew no sin, never sinned, was a perfect son of God, spotless. He goes to the cross and he takes the wrath of God that you and I rightly deserve for our sin. He takes his sin, our sin rather upon himself and the Lord pours out his cup of wrath onto Jesus and Jesus drinks every last drop and Jesus dies in our place, taking the wrath of God upon his, himself. In Jesus' own words, there is separation between him and the father as he takes the sin of the world upon himself. He dies, he's buried, but he doesn't stay dead. Three days later, Jesus rises from the grave, conquering Satan, conquering the grave and conquering our greatest enemy, sin. Sin is your greatest enemy. Sin is my greatest enemy because it's the only thing that separates us from God. Sin is your greatest enemy because it separates you from the greatest treasure, God himself. And Jesus makes the proclamation that he's the only one who can forgive it. 
He's the only one who can truly deal with your sin. No amount of good works can deal with sin. No amount of behavior modification can deal with sin. No other religious activity can deal with sin. No other belief system deals with sin. Jesus Christ is the only one who can take your sins as far as the East is from the West. And praise God for that because we're no match for our sin. If we go toe-to-toe with our sin, we just become slaves. And Jesus is the one who forgives forever when we place our trust in the finished work of him on the cross and the empty tomb. We place our faith in him. We repent of our sin. That's a turning from our sin and place our faith, our trust in him. We have forgiveness. So have you brought your sins to Jesus? Have you done that yourself? We only need to come to him like this paralytic man does in faith. Jesus says he saw his faith. He saw their faith. And that faith in Jesus is what got him forgiveness. Do you bring your sins to Jesus? Or do you beat yourself up? Or do you try to behavior modify or do you try to hide them? Or do you try to do more good stuff to make up for it? None of that actually works. There is only one place you can find forgiveness and it's in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's about. That's the beautiful message of the gospel. So do you have something you need to bring to Jesus? Maybe even right now. Is there something stirring in your heart and your mind? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you that you're convicted of, that you need to go before the throne of God and acknowledge your sin before him. I don't say this to make anyone feel shame or condemnation, but conviction from the spirit is a beautiful gift that can lead to transformation. So where do you need to bring Jesus your sin? Jesus, he's, he's, declaring that he has the authority to forgive sins. But the story doesn't stop there. There's this next story that's very linked that Jesus doesn't just forgive sins. He is in relationship with sinners. Look at this. Verse 13, it says, he went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him. Remember, Jesus is a popular guy. There's, they're thronging about him and he was teaching them. Again, Mark is really elevating the teaching ministry of Jesus. And he passed by this, the, and he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax booth. So Levi, we know him also as Matthew. So if you think of Levi, think of Matthew. Okay. Now Matthew uh, was sitting at the tax booth. Now this tells us a lot about Matthew. And And he said to him, Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So a tax collector, which is what Matthew Levi was, would have to, in order to get their job, put in a bid to the Roman government. I can get you this much money in tax revenue. And whoever had the highest bid, they'd get the job. And they'd be either put on a a kind of a, a, a road where people would travel and pass by, or they'd have a tax booth in a town. And Jesus is passing by and he sees Matthew. Now tax collectors were hated because not only did they work for the Romans who were kind of the oppressors of the Jewish people, but in order for a tax collector to make money, they had to take money from the Jewish people over and above their bid to Rome. That's how they made money. And often they were viewed as greedy liars. They would take in excess uh, of what they actually needed uh, to make a living just because of their greed. And so Jesus, he's walking by. Matthew's gotten a lot of glares in his life. He's been called a lot of things, betrayer, liar, greedy. But Jesus sees him and he engages him. Can you imagine being one of the four disciples that we know were with Jesus at this point, Simon, Andrew, James, and John? Can you imagine what they, what they thought in this moment as Jesus talks to a tax collector and not just talks to him, but what does he say? Follow me. This is the same invitation Simon, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew got. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. This was an invitation for Matthew to join this rabbi as a disciple. Remember, being a disciple was the spiritual Ivy Leagues of the day. 
And not only has the ship sailed for Matthew, Levi, to be a disciple of a rabbi, he's betrayed his own people. And Jesus willingly says, hey, I want to associate with you. I want you to be with me. The invitation to follow is the invitation to be with Jesus. And he rose and followed him. I love this moment in The Chosen where Jesus says, follow me and Matthew in the, in, if you haven't seen the series yet, he, uh, spoiler alert, by the way, sorry about that. But he, he's, Jesus invites him. He says, follow me. And Matthew's like, me? And Jesus with a big smile on his face says, yes, you. It's this beautiful moment. And Matthew begins to follow Jesus. And as he reclined at table in his house, this is Matthew's house now. So they go forward a scene and they're at table uh, having dinner at Matthew's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. I want you to see this again. People wanted to be in the presence of Jesus. And this has been blowing my mind. I'm going to try and slow down and really articulate this because I think it's so beautiful. Jesus was holiness incarnate, perfect, sinless, obedient to the Father, never did wrong. And yet people who were not holy who were sinful, who called sinners and tax collectors, the spiritually lowest rung of this cultural uh, day wanted to be in his presence. Jesus didn't treat them with a holier than thou, get away from me, you gross, unclean, gnarly sinner. They wanted to be in his presence. Jesus has something about him that sinners want to be in his presence. And if you are taught or, or in, in your reading in the scriptures and you think there's a Jesus that, that doesn't love sinners like this, it's not the Jesus of scripture. It may be that you're putting and imposing a lens over Jesus that's not there. Jesus is a magnetic person that sinners were drawn to. And many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, so uh, they're there, apparently. The scribes of the Pharisees are there. And I don't know if they're like outside the window, just kind of peeking in like, what in the world is this guy doing? He's, does, does he know what that guy does for a living? Does he know what she did yesterday? How could he be hanging out with these people, claim to be a rabbi and a holy man? This is some uh, disconnect here. And they question, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And he asked this question to, they asked this question to his disciples, but Jesus is the one who responds. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus says, look, he's actually making a statement to them. You think you're righteous. You think you don't need me. I've not come for people who don't believe they need me. I've come for the spiritually sick. I've come for the sinner. I've come to pursue them in their deepest need, the forgiveness of their sins. I've come to the people who recognize that deep need. And the scribes didn't recognize it. And they were judging Jesus for spending time with sinful people. You know, it's ironic. They're just as sinful. In fact, the story reveals their pride but they didn't see their deep need for Christ. Do you see your need for Christ? Who, who do you relate to in this story? And be honest, you know, just uh, an honest evaluation of self. That's not always easy and fun, but it's valuable. Are you more like the, the scribes who are kind of holier than thou and prideful? Thinking maybe I don't really need Jesus. I've got things together okay. Or do you truly see yourself as the tax collectors and sinners who know their deep, desperate need and want to be in the presence of Christ himself? Because Jesus invites sinners into relationship, which is great news for you and I. He invites us into relationship. We see it all through this passage. Firstly, he invites Levi, the son of Alphaeus. He says, follow me. Come be with me. He opens his heart, his life. He opens himself to Matthew, to Levi. And then it gets even better. 
Many tax collectors and sinners are sitting with Jesus. Jesus invited them into relationship, into friendship with him. He didn't sacrifice his holiness to hang out with this crowd of ill repute. He loved them right where they were. And he loves you right where you are. And as I was reading this this story, this really stood out to me. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples for there were many who followed him. Now, I don't want to make too much of this. I don't know if these were actual disciples that were following him around or if they were just following him in this specific area because he was of his teaching ministry. But clearly they wanted to be with him. Jesus is loving them right where they're at. He doesn't sacrifice his holiness, but he willingly loves them in the midst of their sin. And he does so for you and I as well. He loves you right where you're at. So how would you describe your relationship with Jesus? Do you believe that he can love even sinners and tax collectors? Even sinners like you and I? Jesus invites you into a relationship of intimate friendship with the God of the universe. How would you describe your relationship with him? I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you so much for sticking around and, and thank you really for joining us again for our, our series through the book of Mark. And I just want to challenge you with a couple of thoughts as, as we kind of, as we try to apply what we've heard today. Okay. And the first one is, who do you know that needs Jesus? As we, as we can see in the story that Jesus so loves sinners and he so loves you, we want to think missionally. Who do you know that doesn't believe this Jesus? that doesn't believe the Jesus who's willing to hang out with people of ill repute, tax collectors and sinners. And then the second challenge, as you think about that person, you think about their story, you think about their life is pray for them this week. We've been talking over the last couple of years about this idea called the bless rhythm. It's where you begin in prayer. The L is listening to other stories, getting to know them, listening to the Holy Spirit. Where is he leading you? E is eating with them. Eating is a very relational activity. We even see Jesus doing it in this story today. And then serving and sharing the gospel with them. And so as you pray for people, this is the beginning really to the blessed rhythm. Who is it that you know doesn't know this Jesus? The Jesus who loves people so well, they want to be with him wherever he goes. And begin praying for them this week. Begin praying and asking God, how might you join him in what he's already doing in their life to help them know Jesus? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the reality that you sent your son to pursue us in our deepest need. And I just pray, God, as we think of those that we know that have deep need, the forgiveness of sin, I pray that you would uh, help us to know how to join you in what you're doing in those individuals' lives. And and I just pray ultimately, God, for repentance and faith in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, thank you so much. I love you. Have a good Sunday.